So there are many different uh, technical terms that will be used, and clearly some people will understand all, and some people will understand what to mean. But that's just how it is. So confusion is part of the process of clarification. I'd also like to say something about the general uh, presentation of the conference. Um, because I mean that it's meant to be a platform of inspiration for scientific research, workshops, training programs. That's why the term practical application has been used instead of theoretical and philosophical concepts. Well, I... Okay, I was slow. Um, there are certain problems with this for me. I think positivistic science is not going to make much progress in relation to the uh, And technique has, is a particularly problematic word in relation to the uh, Generally speaking, in Buddhism, they talk of methods. And Heidegger, of course, has made each critique of the nature of technique, of the technical approach to live into the interrelation experience. And I think it's we should be very careful when we talk about techniques. Techniques are things that we apply to things rather than to living surfaces, which are always vibrant and responsive. So methods, somehow we have to be more thoughtful about what we apply and why we apply it. Um, So I'll just start with a few uh, focused remarks and then I'll open up some reflections on the, the mind as it's understood in a particular stream of Tibetan And then think about what that might mean in terms of the daily practice of a psychotherapist. I work in a hospital in London. I see patients in a wide range of settings in the therapy community. And uh, Dharma has a particular uh, coloration, a particular uh, mood or influence in the field of operation of the psychotherapy I'm trying to bring into being, uh, but I hope that it's not a technique. So, <clears throat> mindfulness and other good therapy can help to create a sense of perspective by altering the intensity of the criminal perspectives. They can open up a field of experience less cluttered by prejudice, habit, assumption, and attachment. They do this by not only illuminating the transient and insubstantial nature of phenomena, but aid and awakening to the nature of the one who is having this experience. Okay. However, Buddhism or Dharma is not a new set of techniques which can be appropriated and packaged by enthusiastic psychologists. It is a path to liberation, a path which is only revealed through a particular sensitivity. In the Tibetan traditions, it's often said that one should look on the teacher and hear the teaching, the teacher embodies uh, all the methods of transmission. One should not look on the teacher as a must hear, on the teaching as a must pod, which is a pod that grows on the belly of the, the deer, which is very valuable and see oneself as a hunter. Rather, one should see the teacher as a doctor, the teaching as a medicine, and oneself as a patient. That is to say that the idea of getting something, of adding something into our own existing situation, is enormously tempting for us. And many, uh, Buddhism contains many, many interesting phenomena. And, uh, background that we live in, consumers, capitalism, trains us all to be magpies, endlessly fascinated by shiny objects in the world. So I think how one approaches uh, the general field of Buddhism is very important. Especially because in the modern world, information on everything, and including Buddhism, is readily available. You can go into the internet and get masses and masses of information. Nobody asks who you are, you can just download stuff. There is no relationship embedded in it. Nobody's checking out where you are, is this likely to be helpful for you? No one's necessarily facilitating access and movement. 
So this embodied information can be pretty valuable features. The Bodhisattva Manjushri, who seems to be a particularly embodied wisdom, carries a sword. And it's a sword which can cut through ignorance, but it's a two-edged sword. It can cut ignorance, but it can also cut yourself. And so the idea that one knows something and uses knowledge as a basis for moving towards the world can often be just another form of getting lost. So what's involved in the practice, I think, is a form of auto-critique, the deconstruction of the very solidification which is likely to arise as you move in a more open way towards an engagement with yourself in the world. That is to say, with each movement of gain, one has to allow it to be lost at the same time. And there are many, many uh, Buddhist uh, methods of exploring this. <laughs> While the pragmatic evidence-based cognitive approaches, which utilize mindfulness, can be very helpful, they operate within a Darwinian humanistic framework, which is very different the light of the tradition of Buddhism. I suggest that these differences of paradigm of view mean that what is effected in the use of mindfulness in psychotherapy is a form of technical eclecticism, conceding efficacy disguises the structural impossibility of a true integration. And here I'm referring back to the work of American scholar John Larcross, who wrote a lot in the field of psychotherapy integration in the 80s and 90s, when many people were bringing together different strands of psychotherapy and <clears throat> trying to make more effective composite things, because clearly each development or mood of psychotherapy illuminated some aspects of the lived human condition more than others. But what he found was that unless there is a deep grounding of basic view of uh, compatibility of a vision of what human life is, what our existence is about, then merely uh, adding techniques together will create, in the end, a kind of confusion. So real integration means there has to be an alignment of vision. A technical eclecticism is also possible. You can just add a technique and see how it would be useful in a very pragmatic way. But that means that one's very leaning out, leaning forward into the situation in a way that's likely to lead to a lack of ground in itself. Personally, I would see psychotherapy as a kind of preliminary practice, a way of gaining basic clarity, which is helpful before the work of Dharma practice begins. Most therapy is concerned with helping people manage their engagement with what are traditionally called the eight worldly dharmas. Gain and loss, fame and infamy, praise and blame, pleasure and pain. These are the normal neurotic concerns with which people turn up to psychotherapy. Dharma paths, on the other hand, are concerned with exiting the matrix which generates these concerns. This begins with the radical practice of taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the Buddha, his teachings, and, and the assembly of those who follow. And this concomitant practice of recognizing how much refuge one has sought in objects and in persons who are fundamentally unreliable, no matter how helpful and pleasurable they may seem to be. This is a real turning point. It's a, a shift of vision of a world in which everything reassures me about the centrality of my ordinary sense of self to a vision in which who I am, how I am, everything, what everything is around me is put into question with an opening up to new ways of relating. In that fundamental going about, a fundamental turning away from the stasis, the homeostasis of its release, isn't engaged with, then we find ourselves simply seeking more of the same, with the very subtle systems of editing that I'm sure we're all familiar with. 
in which our selective attention engages with the ever-opening field of experience, only to select the same sort of patterns and choices. So, <clears throat> as in the familiar joke, how many psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. The motivation is very important. If, if somebody wants to engage in a path of liberation, a different kind of motivation is required. If you have an ordinary day-to-day -day problem, uh, irritation in the boss at work, frustration in a relationship, too much alcohol and so on, or unresolved grief reactions, clearly engaging with the felt experience of the limitations of who you are is unpleasant. You do need to have a degree of courage and commitment to see how you function and then to make some shifts. The whole idea of a path of liberation is much more radical because it's saying pervasively everything about how we normally construe our experience is limited and indeed is false and misleading. What we know and rely on is actually illusion. Because we take an illusion as a reality. And I'll say more about this in a moment. So, we are the, the uh, vision in Buddhism, uh, certainly in the Nimapa tradition, which I have. Spend a lot of time training and practicing in. There is the possibility of awakening to our own situation. The idea that what we take ourselves to be and what we actually are are running in parallel streams all the time. It's not that enlightenment is something far away, it's not that we have to work very hard to create a new vision of ourselves to transform ourselves into something else, but simply to awaken to the ways in which we cheat and deceive ourselves moment by moment. That falling in love with the reified, the solidified, objectified structures, the dualistic intoxication that there are objects in the world which will harm me. There are objects in the world which will fulfill and satisfy me. Keeps us fundamentally torn. And this tear, this lesion, is one which uh, has given rise to many, many different kinds of antidotes. Some of these antidotes are spiritual, some are very moral. Everybody is concerned with the incredible difficulty of defining our own existential situation. A lot of the time, we don't talk. We switch on to an automatic pilot. We take one day, that's very similar to the preceding day, as a likely template for the following day. We concern ourselves with basic health and security, and we cocoon ourselves with reassuring, familiar pleasures. Nothing wrong with that, but that is the quality of existence as a human being. And what I would suggest to you is that a fundamental uh, aspect of Buddhism, particularly in the Tibetan tradition, is to put into question whether being a human being is such a great thing after all. <laughs> we tend to have this feeling that humans determine the world. That human beings are the masters, that somehow the world has been given to us, and that it is our responsibility to save it. And so there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of busyness in that, but perhaps a particular kind of hubris, a kind of inflated, narcissistic sense of over responsibility, which gets in the way of taking one's place in the world. Not only that, it means that many, many things will go unexamined. 
in the general Buddhist cosmological scheme, the human domain is just one of many possible manifestations of the possible. That we exist in a whole stream of life and death, birth, death, rebirth. That is to say that cosmological time and the fact of our movement through it has major implications for thinking of the nature of our ontology. What is our being? What does it mean to exist if, in one life you're a frog, in one life you're a denizen of a hell realm, in another life you're a human being? It immediately radically decenters this is me, this is who I am, this is all I am. If you have a one life focused view of existence, and you have a human-centered view of existence, particular readings easily multiply out from that. Life is short, I need to get as much as I can. Nowadays, um, in Britain, people, when they retire, they plan to go on cruises around the world, they want to go and see all the sites that they never managed to see. 40, 50 years ago, they would have been happy staying at home, helping with the grandchildren. But this desire now, I have to squeeze more out of life. You could say it's in some ways fantastic. It's an incredible freedom to move and explore and experience other possibilities. The other side of it is, it speaks of a kind of emptiness. You know, when you've seen some mountain, you've seen every mountain. A mountain is just a big puddle. When you've seen one there, you've seen another there, you just big puddles. It's just water. It's just air. That's what it is. You go to one restaurant, then you go to another. You need some food, and you say, this restaurant is better than that restaurant. This wine is better than that one. The whole of life tumbles moment after moment, seeking for something. We already know that we didn't get what we were looking for, but we try again. Maybe this restaurant is better. You can have a guide. Where's the best place to get fish and chips in Britain? <laughs> if you look that up and dry and you're 100 miles, these particular fishing chips, hmm, you can get sticker to it. I have not been the best fishing chip. <laughs> this should make us weak so appears. And you think of the potential embedded in every being and the incredible ways in which we throw our lives into the wind by awesome leads, blown hither and thither by all sorts of winds. So, part of uh, the view uh, that we come to look at is what is the nature of this world and how, how can we find a place in it, a place that would be meaningful and helpful. First, the general view in Buddhism is a view about change. That the nature of impermanence, that all phenomena are changing. When our noses are pointed in that direction, it becomes rather obvious. We start to think about impermanence. We start to realize that the apartments change, the economic situations change, the seasons change, our own bodies change. There is very little that seems to remain the same. And when we look at these few things that seem to be stable and reliable, we find that in fact, you know. Mr. Obama has gained his uh, present position as ex-president of America on the basis of offering change. <coughs> this is called in the Zen tradition, selling water by the river. <laughs> <laughs> change is already there. He's going to give people something that they already have. Now that makes him a perfect capitalist, and therefore he should be the president. <laughs> we have debuted very easily. We are suckers. We are mouth. We are idiots. We like to fall in love. We believe the answer lies in the magic, in the idealized hero, in the savior, in some other thing outside of self. Because of this, it becomes very difficult to look at oneself. Even when we do look at ourselves, what we find is that the tools for self-examination have been forged, have been manufactured in the factory 
that makes the tools for examining outside phenomena. It's like we get these <coughs> messages on biscuits nowadays. Uh, warning, this may contain peanut particles, because many people are allergic to peanuts. The factory which helps us to see, this is a house, this is a car, this is my mother, this is my father, this is myself. I can see a house, a car, a mom, dad. So, self must be the same kind of thing. This is a thought, this is an emotion, this is red, this is blue. They all seem to have the same semantic uh, bound. The semiotic web in which we move, a web of endlessly changing significations, is one which wraps up. Yes. There might be in others where I might. So those, I think, are always what we're looking at how to pull that out, how to help people see that and know when which choice fits, rather than just the automatic choices. I think there are situations where the role is being overwhelmed, and not necessarily the person. And it's the fault then of management to not recognize for a person, any person of reasonable intelligence and goodwill, they cannot occupy that role under the amount of pressure that's there. And if management don't step in at that point, then the person will feel overwhelmed, and then you get the sickness days and so on, they can't be good enough. So, in the permanent phenomena, into seeing permanent entities is pervasive. One of the founding statements in the, the development of sociology, which of course influenced the development of psychology, is from Emil Durkheim in his introduction to his text on suicide, where he says, social facts are things. So, the statistics about suicide rates in Catholic countries as compared to Protestant countries, this can be dealt with as two things, and we compare and contrast these things. So, you make a confection in your mind, and suddenly it exists as a truly existing entity. In this way, we can see the fabrication of the stepping stones on which we place our feet, our minds, our heart, moment by moment. This is how it progresses. Inventing, taking what we invent to be real, standing on it, it wobbles a bit, but luckily we've managed to invent something else. The main force of delusion is our own creativity. It is the very brilliance of the mind that hides the nature of the mind from us. In Buddhism, we say that the root of this dimension we find ourselves in, samsara, is ignorance. But this ignorance doesn't mean that you're stupid, uh, that you can't understand the two of you for. Even the most brilliant people, Nobel Prize winners and so on, suffer from this kind of ignorance. It is a process of ignoring or not attending to or not being present with the natural radiance or effulgence of the mind as it manifests moment by moment. Clearly, this is a subjective experience. If you enter into this kind of practice, the only uh, touchstone, the only litmus paper that you have is really whether you cheat yourself or you don't cheat yourself. You sit on your meditation cushion with yourself, and you, you, and you try to see. You can import ideas from books you've read, you can find it in some fantasy, but in the end, only you know what is there. Because the nature of experience when we get close to it is unspeakable. We can't say it. And yet, of course, we have to speak. So, in the meditation traditions, there are lots of different ways formulated to help people to indicate, to gesture towards something which can't be spoken. And this is important to hold in mind in the field of clinical work in psychotherapy. Because of course patients come in with their story, with their narrative, they want to tell us something. No, their story is important. Their story is part of them. 
but it's part of them in the way that the bullfighter's king is part of the bullfighter. When the bull is coming, the bullfighter, being very proud, very handsome, he doesn't actually want to die. <laughs> but he wants people to think he's so great he doesn't care. What he really has is this piece of cloth. And he wants the bull to be more interested in a piece of cloth than in him. That way, the bull dies and he doesn't. So, in that way, we need to observe what it is that happens in our relation to ourselves. What is the false self? What is the lure that hooks our attention, just like this Matador's cave, which has us charging after one thing and another and another, never actually getting to the real point of integrated conference, the real meeting. Because when subject and object meet together, they both collapse into each other. And that collapse opens up the sphere of emptiness. The experience that there is nothing at all on which we can rely, but no matter because there is no one who needs to rely on anything. This is not something we're likely to be able to prove in a laboratory. It is something which you can directly experience through practice. I don't know that it's particularly useful in terms of trying to help patients understand this, because you need to have the motive of wanting to have that kind of experience. The experiences reveal themselves through a particular kind of orientation, a particular kind of tilt, that is maybe called a view, a power, a way of looking, not necessarily looking with the eyes in our head, more with the great eyes of our heart, being able to feel directly the living experience of subject and object arising and passing together. Normally, we're concerned with consciousness, consciousness which operates through our sense organs, we're reviewing meditation consciousness, consciousness imbued with the limiting factors of um, aversion, attraction, and so on, and a sort of <coughs> store of ground consciousness, which includes the latent potential of all the many different traits that we've accumulated through time. Consciousness, because it always takes an object, is always on about something. From birth to death, we visit. In the Tibetan tradition, one of the words to describe me is this drawer, which means going, moving, people who are on the move, people who are busy about something. And I think this describes our life. Many people are terrified of boredom. <coughs> they don't want to be trapped in a situation where nothing is very clear, nothing is defined. They want to have something they can get their teeth into, something they can get their hands on, to be about something allows me to feel that I exist. I, me, myself, the ego point of reference, acts as an agent, someone who moves onto the world, marking it, and of course, being totally marked by it. This level of function, with which we're all very familiar, and examine it again and again and become even more familiar with the minutiae of its movements. This is itself a little factory which generates illusion. It's the way of thinking, the way of interpreting experience, which nails particular moments down as being indices or exemplars of other moments. So we build up through time composite pictures of real, truly self-existing entities. And one of these entities is, of course, ourselves. We experience ourselves moving in time, yet somehow always being ourselves. We can all tell stories of what it was like to be at school, what it was like to go on a holiday, what it was like to be unhappy in school, to lose your best friend, and so on. These stories are our stories. They tell us about me, 
But who is this you? Who is the one who relates to the telling of the story? I do. I'm talking about myself. Yes, but who are you? I just told you. I'm the one that's telling you about me. This is an absolutely classic solipsistic structure where a logical delusion allows us to flip over the big gap that something's not being enunciated, something's not being clearly described. We're up to something. We're up to not looking at the ground or the source of the content of the answer to who is the one who is speaking, who is the one who is talking. So, I'll just describe very briefly uh, a structure for the generation of this world and ourselves in it as given by uh, a great uh, yogi in the past called Pabitsa And it's a, a form which you see in many different uh, versions in the uh, general Nimapa and Kajipa traditions. The first stage of uh, separation or origination is said to be a, a co-emergent ignorance. That is to say, a state where the tilting away, the not attending to, and the vital presence of that which is about to be not attended to, shiver together. They're just there in the same place at the same time. <coughs> this state is uh, sometimes given in the traditional example of a drunk man walking home. Very drunk, very happy in himself, no problems in a good night. And he falls down a flight of stairs. There's a shock and a confusion. <coughs> I'm still here. Oh, what's that? Who are you? And in that moment, the, the, the flow of the continuity, which didn't have to be examined because it was undisturbed, is suddenly disrupted, and a new form of order is installed, an order based on the most basic or primitive kind of cognition, the sense of self and the sense of not-self. A retentive pulling back away from the field of experience. And so instead of being an integrated field of experience, there is now an experiencer of both themselves. There's a self reflexive movement. There's no reflection going on because there's not advanced cognition, but in an immediate thing, almost like an amoeba, and at the same time, a differentiation from the field. When this occurs, you start to uh, have an elaboration. Because the more you have reflection on the side of self, with the development of information about the field of experience, there's an increasing separation. And that gives rise to what's traditionally seen as the second level of ignorance, in which everything gets named, everything gets allocated and identification. With this, there's then the seeming definite basis for uh, life, which is, I know what's going on. I'm, I'm somebody who can start to make sense of it. Because things are what they are to me to be. I am the center of my determinacy, so I can start to pull on other information to reinforce this sense that there is a centrality to my existence. There is also, of course, a vulnerability, because I've now taken on the burden of being a consistent self. Now, we sit in this room, and very gently, if we were to reflect on how consistent we are, we may feel slightly like imposters. We may feel rather hypocritical. We may have a little name tag to start to you as a psychologist, or a psychiatrist, or something like that. And sometimes you probably think, what am I doing? Um, you might wake up in the morning and look at your own life and think, 
maybe I should take my name tag off and not go to work today because how can I sit in the chair? I don't feel very good. I don't feel very clear. But other people expect me to be like that. But of course, that's the problem. We let people down if we didn't do that. We might feel ashamed ourselves. So we continue feeling slightly fraudulent, a bit more makeup. That's the advantage they will have. We may have been more bold than exposed, but anyway, we go through life slightly brazenly smiling and pretending. And this is part of the structure of this world called samsara, which is based on pretense. It is indeed like a vast sadhu. It is a, a place in which roles are offered to us in the matrix of the family structure, and we continue to operate these roles, even when in our adult interactive life. The roles we do are not very helpful. These unrevised reciprocal roles, poor schemas, whatever we want to call them, continue as a map in our head to misread the environment, but because they have become egocentric to us, because they affirm our sense of who we are, we prefer to ignore the messages coming from the world. And a great deal of therapy is about helping people to stay present with a, a perception of the world long enough to realize that how they make sense of it is unhealthy. That they are misreading situations in the name of affirming themselves, but actually acting to undermine their own sense of the <coughs> The third level of ignorance that develops from this is known as the ignorance of ignoring or being blind to the nature of karma. Karma basically means that actions have consequences. They have consequences for the mainstream or stream of existence of the of the one who is performing the action. And it might be useful here just to look a little bit at the traditional structure of how karma operates, because it's a word that's often misunderstood. It's not something mystical at all. In this tradition, we see as having four aspects. The first, known as the basis, is that of reification. Karma begins when you see yourself as a subject separated from the pure objects. I exist, you exist. This is like one of these old Van de Graaff generators where you have two points that build up a charge of electricity between them. It means that we're all sparking with the environment around us. We're getting off on things. Things are getting to us. This basis leads into the development of particular thoughts or intentions. I love that. I love that. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, so, this tension builds up from positions that we pick up because we find ourselves processing the situation. So, we have an intention towards the environment. One of the great uh, areas of the inquiry into intentionality is in modern phenomenology through the cerebral and so on. Their reading helpfully fits with a great deal of Buddhist phenomena. There are many different uh, tracks of phenomenology. The most famous and most elaborated in the West is the work of Dogon in Japan, but in the Tibetan tradition as well. There's a lot of ways of attending to the immediacy, the facticity of experience, which is achieved through learning not to succumb to it or to break it off the habitual tendencies to interpretation. But in terms of karma, the second stage is when we, we go into the intention, we start to nurture and develop an idea. This is me, this is what I want to do. So, for example, you might see someone and you want to become their friend. So, you have a desire to get close to them. So you are now tilted out towards them, thinking, if I get more of their time near me, I will feel better. They can complete my life in some way. This leads into the second, the third stage, 
which is to bring about a situation in which the subject and the object meet together and have a, a real interaction. An event takes place and, and somehow now this person is my friend. I feel I've arrived someplace. Then the fourth uh, stage is the consolidation of that, in which you think that action is good, I'm glad it's happened, I'm happy to have this person as a friend. This means that we settle into the real existence of this. I, I now have a real friend, and this is good, I like it, my life's better. What has actually happened is that there have been movements in time and space in which you met the person, had a coffee, had a laugh, and say you're going to meet again. The time you had coffee is gone, the next time you meet when a coffee is hasn't yet come, but in between, I've got a friend. What have you got? A friend. Where is the friend? I don't know, they're out having fun somewhere. But I've got them anyway. Put them in your pocket. <laughs> if you've got something that doesn't exist, that is not yet come or has already gone, but mm, makes me feel good. So this development of illusory identification leads us into this world of dreams. This is indeed the realm of transfers in the, in the classical Freudian sense, that we are always transferring a matrix of experience from a primitive unthought, early position, out into the world. And we don't see it coming. Our world is already there awaiting us before we arrive. Because the world we get to is always our We can't escape from our own projections, editings, fantasies, and so on. So, that, in very brief, is a description of how we become encapsulated in our own individuality. An individuality which we may not share with others. I think the, the question of empathy is a, a very interesting one. Can we really uh, be in touch with someone else's experience? <coughs> Perhaps not. The uh, lately, sadly deceased uh, Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Leibniz, says there is a fundamental alterity to all existence, and that it is a fundamental violence to anyone to claim to know them. Because to know something is to subsume it inside the rubric of the old frame of reference. And that the other, as other, constantly calls us out to be other to ourselves. One of his great books is called Otherwise Than Being. That when we think we are who we are, and that I know that you are who you are, we've already damaged ourselves by falling asleep away from the vibrant immediacy of actual content, in which we've no idea what's going to happen. We really don't know. That's why the, the focus on cognitions is not all helpful. Because cognitions, if we develop them well, help us to concretize and control a world which is always falling away. And of course, as an interim measure, that's very useful. But it does keep us ever more busy. There's always more to be thought about because thoughts tend to snaggle and tear and move together. How to deconstruct this ever weaving matrix of thought? Well, this is where practice comes in and <clears throat> the awakening to the nature of the mind itself, a mind which is not an entity but is an unborn lucidity. Unborn in the sense that when we look for our mind, we can't catch it. We can certainly sort of catch our thoughts. They move pretty quickly. They're like eels and little fish. But somehow you can get a sense of what you're thinking. But as soon as you become aware of what you're thinking, your thoughts change. The same with feelings, the same with sensations. <laughs> this illusive, contingent, ever evanescent wave in which we live is one which we cannot appropriate. Therefore, we need a method of meditation which is beyond appropriating, which is not looking to gain something, to get something. There's no doggy bag, there's nothing to take home. All there is is just this 
Trust this. Trust this. There never will be anything more. There is no accumulation. There is no gain. There is just this. And we're either here or we're not here. We're either here or we're not here. But we're not. But we're not. And then as soon as we come to ask the question, but where are we? And the concomitant question, and who am I? Who is the one who is having the experience of asking the question, where am I? Who am I? You can go into an infinite regress of questions. Or, rather than sitting in the sight of the subject, looking at the object, the object is a true mirror of the subject, which is a false, delusive mind to which there is no end. We relax into the mirror of the one who asks the question, who am I? And that mirror falls back endlessly ceaselessly, revealing more and more natural unborn clarity and the co-emergence of subject and object together. That is to say, not only are we a field phenomenon, but the whole world is just the field. So, well, there is a basic non-duality of experience. That is to say, the primal tear or rift, which appeared to be between samsara and nirvana, between being asleep or being awake, between subject and object, doesn't need to be stitched up, because it wasn't a tear. It was simply an unfolding. So, if you've got curtains over a loop, and you open the curtains, when they were flat, they were in one night, and as you pull them in, they fall in on each other. The curtain's there, but you can't see that bit of the curtain. It hasn't vanished, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just folded into itself. And that's really what the state of ignorance is. An encapsulation and enveloping of itself in itself. And the natural unborn awareness reveals itself in the moment by moment as our consciousness. We don't become stupid. We still know where the bus stop is. We still know whether you're vegetarian or not. We still know which is your key, which is someone else's. But what is this thought? What does the thought tell me about? It's uh, I'm feeling sad. What does that tell me? It tells me a thought arises, I'm feeling sad, and for whatever reason, I'm telling you. Does it tell me about me? Does it tell me about me? It tells me about itself. Thoughts speak of themselves. Thoughts show themselves. In the language of Bhakti, we have Bhakti, the great Russian literary theorist, particularly in his dialogic writing around Dostoevsky and so on, speaks of the polyphony of voices, the way in which each character is revealing themselves through an endless sequence of positioning responses. If you try to define a character, they become flat, they become two-dimensional. A large character in a novel is one that's always elusive. You can't quite get it. Just as a real human being, you'll never get them. How will you ever get to yourself? As long as you're alive, you will be changing. This is dependent co-origination. This is the contingency of our existence. So, when we come to experience this opening, what is revealed is the movement of subject and object together, a subjectivity which is both us and not us. It is us as the expressive movement of the way of becoming but it is not us in that it doesn't define who we are. There is no way to define the essence of existence because there is no essence to existence. There is no core that you can hang on to or describe, and yet there is a ceaseless revealing. Traditionally, this is described as a situation which is unborn and unceasing. When we look into ourselves, we can't find any. There is no mind itself of an entity. And so in that sense, it's, it's as if it was unborn. And yet, moment by moment, something is going on. In that way, it's unceasing. 
So in relation to psychotherapy, this is really not an issue of techniques to be brought in to work with a dyad or a group or whatever. Rather, it's the possibility of the therapist not being snarled up in the invitations to dualistic confusion and confrontation. Now, most people, most forms of therapy are concerned with this. You get the, the stuff, um, let's say, Jeremy Sapper and Rogers in the Therapeutic Alliance. The thing about a Therapeutic Alliance is that, again, it's a dynamic movement of energetic interaction. It's not a thing. It's like people talk about having a relationship. In the sense, there's no such thing as relationship. There is the ongoing process of collaboration, that we're always working together, gesturing together. There is no stasis, there's no way to arrive. It's not John loves Jill, Jill loves John, great, they've got that good relationship. Because when you look, who is John and who is Jill, you don't find anyone. It's only when John and Jill haven't a clue who they are, but they seek the reassurance of John, and do you love me? Oh, Jill, I do. That looks beautiful, but from the point of view of the possibility of awakening, it's poison. It doesn't mean that if you get awakened, you can't have sex anymore. <laughs> sex is also possible, but maybe with a little bit more lightness and a little bit more freshness, because there is no leaning on to the other, seeking them as a support, but an open vital meeting. So, just very briefly to bring this to an end, therapy. The central question for therapy is how to resist being trapped in the invitations to familiar repetition, repetition compulsion. Every patient wants to be reassured that their neurosis is actually healthy. Because once you start to let go of your neurosis, you're faced with a genuine ontological question. Who am I? If I'm not depressed, who am I? What will I do with my life? Much easier to be depressed or alcoholic or OCD. So the striving in the patient to get the therapist to give either confirmation and reassurance or answers, who should I be? Tell me who I am. This is intense. And all of us, from the point of view of our ego, want to be used. That's the whole thing about uh, the ego position. The ego uh, is the self-referencing self -referencing matrix of habitual thoughts which coalesce together with a seeming uh, inherent existence. And they want to be confirmed. We want to be useful. We want to be helpful. What's wrong with happy people? But what does it mean? To help people. Who is the one to help people? I do. I can help them as this much help. Oh, so you get paid for being a healthy person. Yes. This is the discourse of dualistic interaction. And of course, it's true. It's one of the many dimensions of our existence, but it's not the whole. And the purpose of reintegration is not collapsing one domain, samsara, into nirvana, getting out of it, going somewhere else, but to recognize that there is an undifferentiation. That is to say, there are no real walls or barriers through the domain. And the more one moves easily across or finds oneself manifesting in different ways as the expression of these domains, the more in moment by moment situations you can manifest according to what's required. Which is why, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, many of the deities show many different. Forms. They indicate that our expression in the world, our being in the world with others, is always energetic, dynamic, and responsive, and cannot be reduced to be this or that. However, the social dimension of our being, of identity cards, passports, and so on, and other people's attachment to us in terms of the map they have of us in their head requires us to be exactly this or that in a reliable way. So we're a father or a mother or a son or a friend or a lover or whatever. 
and people want us to stay in these roles. So, the more the therapist can stay awake and fresh and recognize the contingent dialogic nature of the role that manifests, they won't take themselves too seriously, and they also won't take the patient's neurosis too seriously, and so they can bring a playful movement into the interaction. Okay. That's it. The end.